tell you, it's really great to be able to come and to share some of the things that are in this book. But I can't tell you all of the stories that are behind it because there were several of them that got cut out because they were a little bit too risque. <laughs> and, and so you have to blame, you have to blame Brenda uh, for the first cut. Then you got to blame uh, uh, all of the people that put this thing together. And I want to really put the tip. Cynthia Vatu, who is a friend of mine that uh, was was brought into my life because we were looking for somebody to record my life. And what uh, we had to do was go up to her kitchen table and we sit there and she had certain things that she outlined as to how to start this and what to do. And, and so as we, we got into uh, reminiscing about this and reminiscing about that, uh, she had uh, stuff on the first chapter, uh, the seventh chapter, the tenth chapter, uh, the eleventh chapter was all mixed up. And so she tried to put it all together and so along come Reneva Moss and here comes Brenda Hewitt and Tom Nelson. And I want to tell you, they took that whole mishmash and they pushed it all together and then brought it out and that's what the book is all about. And the book is, is, is 16 chapters and those chapters are, are all full of uh, good stories. There was a few bad stories that I had argued that we wanted to leave them in there. But uh, uh, apparently there was uh, such that you couldn't very well leave them in there and be able to face the public and particularly face my son, who is an assistant pastor. <laughs> particularly in the chapter where I had three whorehouses in Deenana uh, during the reconstruction of the Alaska Railroad and how that all came together. It's all in the book. <laughs> when I was an entrepreneur, one day I was sitting in the, in the store and my brother and I, that was after my father had passed away, and so I was the younger brother. So I was the one that always had to clean the meat saw, and I was always the one that had to take lunch at 1 o'clock. Bob would take lunch from 11.30 until 1, and I'd go from 1 until, until 2.30. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the kind of things that happen when you're the youngster of the family. And so uh, uh, that was all part of the intrigue of this book. In this book is that if you look at the front cover, <clears throat> you'll see the guy that's got the coggy hat on is me, because I was always promoting trade with coggy. That was my dad's uh, 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 handle that he used when he was uh, when he had the, the, the trading coach in Minana. And and Bill, my oldest brother, who's still living in California, he's a retired colonel. He's uh, uh, in the middle, and then over here on the other side. And we all had pretty skinny, bony legs because mom, being from England or from Wales, uh, always had us in short pants. And we were the only people in Ninana that wore <laughs> short pants. And, and when we didn't wear, when we graduated from short pants, we wore knickers, and and everybody in school wore uh, black bear cords, and so uh, we finally convinced Dad to to talk to Mom about these knickers and these short pants and everything. That we'd like to get ourselves into the mainstream of living in Alaska and particularly during mosquito time. <laughs> because I tell you, when you have bony legs like that, and then you turn around on the backside of the, of the, 
know, one picture is worth 10,000 words in my estimation. And here's the three of us, Bill, Bob in the middle, and me on the end, in front of a wood pile back in 1927, I believe, when that picture was taken, uh, behind the, the store there in the Nana. And of course, uh, uh, that's a long story, but we had a two-story building that Dad moved into the Nana. He, 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 he came to Alaska. He came to Alaska in, in 1906. Uh, and he came to Fairbanks and he was a printer. He was a printer by trade. And he worked in the, in the print shop and he was a, 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 a type thrower. And that was before a line of type, before typewriters, before anything, when you had to have the boxes and the trays, and you had the, the, the different trays and the different fonts and all the rest of it. And you just, you, 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 we, you had a way of doing that by what you knew, what was in what those trays. And the thing is that when I was four years old, Dad used to make the ice cream tickets. And I used to have to put the the the, the uh, type together to do the, the type, the different fonts that you have, which is the different sizes of the type. And you have to learn to go from the bottom side of the page, and everything is backwards. Because when you're running in that easel, what you're doing is that you put the if you have an and, where you put the D in there, and then you put an N in there, and then you put the A, and then you put a spacer, and then you go on and, and, and on and on and on and on until you get it all put together. And Dad would used to have wooden picks that he kept in his mouth that uh, was about that long, and he'd take, and that's where he would, he would go in, and he would take and identify if you left out a spacer or what was one thing or another. So that was how I learned to, to write. And so when I went to school, when I was six years old, why they uh, were astounded that I could read, but I read backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, how come you're reading backwards? Well, I was taught that way. <laughs> well, who taught you that way? Well, my dad, because my dad's a printer. And the printer was somebody that did everything from the bottom of the page, and you went up this way. And so I had some real problems with that with the teachers, but we got through that all right. In the in the in the book, and I'm not going to relieve, reveal to you all of the secrets that are in here, because there's some real good, good tasty stories that you should read, and and and. Uh, I think that it's part of living in Alaska, but it's growing up in a country that was in its infancy. Because when we, when we were growing up in the old trading post, why, uh, we used to have to get up in the middle of the night to make sure that the stoker was, was taken care of, because old Henry Kaiser, who had the power plant, because you see, Ninana was a railroad town to begin with, but when uh, the railroad got completed and the bridge in Ninana got completed and everything moved to Fairbanks, why the power plant that the railroad had uh, closed down, and there was a, a Signal Corps guy <laughs> by the name of Henry Kaiser, uh, and Henry uh, bought a one-cylinder Fairbanks Morris uh, 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 diesel engine with a with a long belt to it, which was hooked to the generator, and he would fire that old Fairbanks Morris engine up by using a blowtorch to heat the upper side of the of the the the, the, the uh, uh, cylinder. And once he got the cylinder red hot, why he would use this air compressor to start this great big wheel going, and the wheel would go two or three times, and then all of a sudden, kaboom! 
and then it would go kawum, kawum, kawum. It would go three times. The first time it went was when it fired off. The second time was when it sucked the air in. And the third time when it came back up, it exhausted. And so that was the three, uh, and that's where Johnny got the name Flywheel Johnny. Because when Johnny was just a youngster, he disappeared one day. And of course we had a real religious uh, uh, order in town that no kid in Nenana could go across the railroad tracks because of the river. And, and so everybody would do their mischief and find what they needed to do on the inside of the railroad tracks. Well, Johnny was uh, an inquisitive sort of a guy, I guess. And uh, he was living, I think he was probably about five years old then. Uh, and we were living uh, about a block and a half away from the power plant. He decided to go in there and see what it was all about because it was a restricted area. <laughs> of course, I think that he still uh, ventures into restricted areas <laughs> in lots of ways. And I think that's why he's been such a good politician. Because not that he followed what I did, because if he followed what I did, in this day and age, he'd still probably be in jail. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and so he went in there and he was taking a look at this big old diesel engine that was through the uh, uh, diesel fuel because it apparently the way the pump had it, why it would anything that was left over, why it bypassed it. And old Kaiser had a had a, a double boiler. You know what a double boiler is? One of those those uh, uh, boilers that boil clothes that the old timers used to have that about that high and it's oblong like this and and the. Ladies used to put that on the back of the stove, and they'd, they'd keep their clothes and boil all of the white stuff uh, so that uh, you didn't have all of the luxury of all of the chemicals that you have today. I think that at that time or other, while we had Pell's naphtha soap, and, and you had uh, powdered uh, uh, white soap that they called white soap. Um, so anyway, John took this adventure and uh, everybody was looking for him and looking for him and they couldn't find him. And finally, out of all of these oil drums that were stacked behind the power plant came this little towhead bouncing back and forth. And so uh, uh, the fellow that, that found him coming out of the power plant was Hank, Kep Hank, Hank Olson, who uh, was, uh, the head of the FAA uh, boat uh, structure in, in, in Nenana at the time. And so he was the guy that said, well, I found him. Well, where did you find him? I found him in the flywheel house of the power plant. And so from that point on, why he was named Fly house, Fly, Flywheel Johnny. And that's where he got that name, the, the, the flywheel. So, and there's lots of other stories that uh, are in this in this book, and I I want you to, to get a copy. Sure, I'm promoting it. I'm promoting it because they told me that I better promote it. <laughs> and, 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 and chapter one of my book is uh, 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 about my dad coming to Alaska and how he came up by store, steerage how it took him 13 days to travel from, from Valdez to Fairbanks by walking. And it took him four days after he got here in the steam bath in order to get all rid of all of the bed lice that he picked up in the roadhouse between here and there. And uh, he went to work for, for uh, W.F. Thompson, who at that time had the minor news in Fairbanks. And uh, he says, I don't want to do this. He says, I, th I think I want to see what the world is all about. So he went and, and Thompson got him a job 
uh, uh, driving uh, thaw uh, uh, pipes into the ground where they would thaw it down with water until they until they could take and shovel that out with, with uh, number two shovels and a wheelbarrow and get enough out so that they could take it and put it through the sluice box. Well, he tried that for for one summer and he says, that's not right for me. He says, my hands were all swollen up. So he says, the next thing I did was, he says, they, they said, well, what we'll do, Coggy, was, they called him Coggy. He says, what we'll do is we'll give you uh, uh, 300 or 500 subscriptions to the minor news and we'll give you a route between Fairbanks and Esther Creek. Uh, if you sell those 500 uh, sub subscriptions, we'll give you 500. And so that'll give you enough to make your nest egg. He says, okay, so for the first two weeks, he walked from Fairbanks all the way out, past Creamers, and Creamers was just a field at that time, and uh, uh, up over the hill. In fact, uh, he was there when Burnell, uh, and they put, uh, put the, the cornerstone for the University of Alaska in the later years. He was still running his, uh, his, his uh, tour. Well, anyway, so he went, he sold the first two days, he went out there, he sold uh, all a thousand copies of the of the paper. He came back; they were really impressed with him, uh, and so he bought a horse and a double ender. And you know what a double ender is? A double ender is a is a sleigh that has the the, the runners go up this way in the back and go up this way in the front. And that's why they called them double enders. And the thing is that he would take two double enders and his little old horse, and he would take, and he had an express uh, uh, office at the old Nordale Hotel, not the one on 2nd Avenue, but the one on 1st Avenue, the one that burned down, I think that now the courthouse is down there where the, the original Nordale Hotel was. And he would move up, and, and, and so that intrigued everybody that he had this uh, thing going and he could take that, that double ender and go. And so a fellow by the name of Jimmy Barracks, who had uh, the uh, Samson Hardware, that's the first guy that had Samson Hardware, not Johnny, uh, but uh, Jimmy Barracks. Jimmy Barracks uh, talked him into getting a car. He says, why don't you get a car? He says, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Say, how much is the car? $900. Well, where do I get it? Well, you can buy it in Portland and ship it up. So he shipped it up. Uh, the car came in five crates. Uh, uh, it, was, it came to St. Michael, and from St. Michael's it was, came up by steamboat up to Fairbanks, and the five crates were offloaded in front of the old NC, Northern Commercial Company, uh, dock down there where the bank is now. And uh, Dad figured, well, 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 so they got out the, the instructions. And the next thing you know, why they had the thing all backwards, and they took it apart, and finally they got it all put together. And they said, well, how are we going to get this? Well, you have to go down to the Northern Commercial Company, and you have to buy benzene. Benzene? What the hell is benzene? You know, he knew what uh, oats was and straw was for the horse and stuff like that. So anyway. Dad got the, the, this, this, this thing and he loaded it up with this, uh, with this high-powered gasoline, which was called benzene, and kaboom! And it started up, and the flames were coming out all over the place, and they called the, the fire department. The fire department came out, and they put it out, 
and then his car was white. <laughs> all of the extinguishers came on. So he, he fired it up again, and this time, why, they had it where that the throttle that they had on there, which was a linkage throttle to the floor, uh, had not been hooked up, and that's the reason why it took off in the, and, and overloaded itself, and firing off. So anyway, he, he said, well, I got finally got that put together. And so he started at the Nordale Hotel, and he would have uh, uh, an express service going between Fairbanks and Estherquick. And he could haul three pa passengers, no more than three passengers, and one of the things that they had to do is that they had to agree that they would get off at College Hill and push the car up over the hill. <laughs> they didn't do that why they weren't they weren't given the passage to go on, on that picture. Other than that, he says it was great having this one cylinder. It was called a one cylinder brush. The, the, the name of the car was a brush. Brush it was a German made car. And the thing is that he says it was great because instead of having that horse which you had to mind all the time, he'd get that car past Kramer's Dairy, the Kramer's Field, and he'd get it in those ruts and then he could take a snooze for 15 minutes <laughs> plus the, uh, the, the, the old truck or car would, would take him over until he started it laboring hard. He knew he was on College Hill and that's when he had Stop. All right, guys, you've got to get up and push the car up over the hill. And, uh, and then Jimmy Barracks, of course, who had Samson Hardware, was also the Ford dealer. And he talked to Dad, and of course, about this time, my dad had joined the Masonic Order, and he had uh, Ozzy Ross, and I could name you a dozen Nerland, and a whole bunch of the, the old timers that were part of the uh, dad's entourage and help him get things going. And I think that that was probably, as you read this book, all the way through the book, is the fact is that the camaraderie up until World War II, up until World War II, the camaraderie in Alaska was absolutely the best, the best that you could fare. Because if you had a problem, people would come to you. In 1936, in the fall of 36, October 36, our uh, whole block in Ninana burned down. Dad had his store, his warehouse, and everything. I remember it was in October. Almost all of the supplies that had come up by the river and were in the in the in the warehouse, in the back of the store. And we lived upstairs. Uh, this, the, uh, October the 2nd, why there was a nice north wind blowing, which made it just right for things, because we were right in the middle of the block, and the bakery was <coughs> next to us. In fact, I could still, whenever I dig around there, I could still pick enough bricks that old Rappold had with his, uh, when he had the, the, the old Dutch bakery there in the Nevin. In fact, I've got several of them on my, my, my uh, front porch right today. Every time it seems that I go digging up anything, and John, he, he, you know, whenever he comes to Nina, I always have two or three things that I'd like to have him do. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's going to go back to Nina with me this time. Uh, when when we go back, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to. Well, I got four projects. <laughs> we won't, we won't do Anyway, my book, uh, you know, goes from, uh, and if you if you take a look at the at the, the face of it, and of course, I give special thanks to all of those folks, and and to to uh, uh, Brenda and to Tim Nelson who put the, who put the printing book together, and we have a thousand copies already uh, have established that we're going to order another thousand of them keep things going. So we got 16 chapters. And and the last chapter is telling you, well, uh, 
this has been a great story, but there's a lot more to go. So I left myself open that if I get into too many gyrates, way, I'll write you a second copy. <laughs> they made you take Pardon? out. I want a copy of the parts they made you take out. <laughs> <laughs> we got some good ones in here. We got some good ones in here when when I went back. Well, tell you the story about about I was in the store, nine years old. Uh, you always had to go to the store and you always had chores that you had to do. Uh, you had wood to bring in, and you had ashes to take out, and you had this to do and that to do. And I was down in the store after supper, and old French John, his name was John Olette, but he was a Canadian Frenchman, and they called him French John, came in, and he says, Hi, Coggy, I got a problem. And I says, Well, can I help you? He says, Do you know anybody that would help me put John Lund in a casket. Dad says, don't have anybody in mind, but Jackie will help you. <laughs> <laughs> so I go get my jacket, and I go with French John, and we go down to this warehouse. It's the winter time. It's cold. Uh, here's old French John, or I mean, uh, uh, Jack, uh, John Lund laying there, stiffer in a board, and we put a jacket on him, and French John says, I'll pick him up by the shoulders, and you pick him up by his feet. And we picked him up, and we took him over. Here, I'm nine years old. Put him in the casket, and laid him down, got him all suited up and everything, because it was colder than the Dickens, and he was going to freeze. He was going to freeze up. So that's why they had to do that right away. And that's the reason why French John had come. So got that, got that all done. Cast it on. Took a Yukon sled. You know what a Yukon sled is? How many of you Alaskans know what a Yukon sled is? <laughs> yeah, there's, I know there's one or two that do. And that's a, uh, a sled that's about that high. Stanchions are about that high about that wide, usually about 12 feet long, with not, it's not a double ender, and it has just the one side, and, you, and the reason why they called them Yukon sleds is because they had the G-pole on the front end, and the G-pole is what they st steered the, 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 the thing with. Yeah. And anyway, <coughs> we got him on there, we took him down to the Pioneer Hall, Got them all squared around. Come back. Mother says, where have you been? I was helping French John. French John do what? Well, we had to put John Lund in the casket, and Dad sent me to help. It took Dad four, time, four days to get out of the good graces of Mom. For <laughs> <laughs> having his, his, his precious little boy go and put them. Well, the end of the, the, the start of the story, not the end of the story, the start of the story is that French John moves out of Ninana. So old C.C. Hyde, Clara Hyde, who was the U.S. Commissioner, who by the way was the, was, uh, uh, the daughter of Judge Hyde, who was the judge of the first judicial district. She was uh, the commissioner. She was the United States commissioner in Ninana. And the U.S. <coughs> commissioner had all kinds of authority in those days, in the territorial days. And uh, she came into the store about two years later and said to my dad, Mr. Coghill, is Jackie around? Dad says, oh, that kid's in trouble again. He's in trouble again. <coughs> Jack Devereaux died. Jack, and I want you to take care of it. Well, Jack Devereaux had asthma real bad, and they called him Whistling Jack. 
where Jack Whistling Jack was uh, quite a guy. And I went up to his cabin. Sure enough, he was sitting up in bed because he only had pillows around him. He was sitting up in bed because that's the only way he could rest because he had this asthma so bad. And so I says, well, I don't know. We got a problem here. He's a pretty heavy guy. I guess I'll get somebody. So we went. I went down to the Pioneers Hall, and I got a fellow, a Swiss guy by the name of Al Linder. And Al Linder was uh, uh, the night watchman on the on the waterfront. And 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 I'll end with this one. But you read the book. There's some good stuff. <laughs> especially when, especially how I got involved with three whorehouses. <laughs> Swiss guy, and he was about as wide as, and about as thick and about as tall as he was all the way around. I mean, he was a real roly poly guy. And he was the president of the Pioneers Igloo number 16 in the end. Sure, I'll help you. So he went up, we went up to the cabin, and uh, it was in the summertime. So he says, Well, we got to get him out of this cabin. So we got an old door, a couple saw horses. <coughs> we set him out in the front yard and uh, got him all square ground. And Jack says, well, or Al says, well, have you got a casket? What are you going to do? He says, oh, we already ordered that the train's coming in tomorrow morning and we'll get him, OK? So we set him up and we got him all prepped and Al says, got to wait a minute. Got to go. I got to, I'll be back in about 10 minutes. He went up to his house and he got a big jug of uh, homemade juice, bootleg juice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he set that up. He says, so what are you doing? Oh, we got to toast him. <laughs> so, we got them all cleaned up. Oh, got to toast it. So had a couple cups. Here's to Jack. Here's to Jack Devereaux. Okay? Okay? Is that okay? Sure, that's okay. Here I am, you know, 12 years old. <laughs> Skinny as could be. Couldn't, I wasn't absorbing much of this stuff. <laughs> Home brew was pretty easy going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pretty good. So we got him all, all, all dressed up and everything, and set him up. Had a couple more snorts. I went home, and here's this 15-year-old kid walking about that high off of the ground. Where have you been? Well, the commissioner come and got me because Jack Devereaux passed away, and I went and got Al Linder, and, and we toasted him two or three times. <laughs> that was pretty good stuff. <laughs> Dad says, well, you got to remember, you can toast him, but just do that very often, not very often. because uh, <laughs> Anyway, the next day, we come and we take the blanket off of Jack, <coughs> And we go up to the train station and we get the man-made Hosey Ross uh, casket, one of these caskets. That, and in the book, you'll find some two good some stories when, you, when I started getting people that were frozen and, and, and they were stiff and I had to get them out of the casket. And uh, there's a couple stories in here. That, uh, so anyway, we got all, all, all uh, Al Linder back, and I says, well, Mom said you can have Al Linder help you, but don't drink any more of his juice. <laughs> so we got him in the, in the, in the casket, and we took him down, put him in the Pioneer Hall, got ready for the, for the uh, service. And because it was summertime, why well, we had to leave the lid open because it was pretty warm. <coughs> 
we came back in there about a half hour before the Pioneer when I have a service, and here's Jack setting up in the casket. <laughs> sitting straight up. Al says, there's nothing wrong with that. He says, that was just that juice we were drinking. Pushed <laughs> <laughs> him down, laid him down, back up this way, closed the casket, and everything was fine. <laughs> three good stories. I know that you're going to, that you haven't got time to listen to all of them, but there's some good stuff in here about Bill Egan and I and how we uh, did the organization of the Constitutional Convention and how we put that stuff together. And, 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 and there's some other good stories in here about what what was what uh, happened when uh, uh, Wally Hickel and I broke ranks and and uh, I had to leave uh, his administration because he had a couple old goon boys that uh, wouldn't listen to anything that we talked about because actually when you get right down to it that second term that he put in there uh, and I'm not bashful in telling you it was our program that got him elected, and it was Joe Vogler's program and all of us that got him uh, got him elected the second time, but the Anchorage crowd took over halfway through. The, so what did I do? I says, okay, that's fine. If you're going to do that, I realize he's governor and there's only one governor. So what am I going to do? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take on a project. And I took on the project of the RS-2477, the so roads and trails in Alaska that Joe had started earlier and they had only asserted one. Well, by the time we got done, I got 27 boxes in my in a Kano box in Nenana. And out of those 27 boxes, we asserted nine uh, trails in Alaska and there's, there's 23 trails that we can assert, but you have to, it takes an awful lot of process to get through them. So that was one of the things that, in the legacy of, of growing up in Alaska, is that we're going to make sure that we have the country open, open to, to the people in Alaska so that they're not restricted in their travel. And read the book. A lot of fun. Thanks very much.